Winter's coming. Did you notice? Anyone notice? Do you know when that bad freeze is coming? Mm -hmm. They say it's going to be worse winter than last year. It was negative three in my place last uh, February. Do you know when that's going to happen? I'm asking you. For long. You don't know what's going to happen, do you? But you now know that it could, because God gave you a warning last February, didn't he? And it's not summer anymore, is it? Winter's coming. Did you notice? You don't know exactly what's coming and exactly when it's coming. But you're not breaking out all your shorts, are you? Getting stocked up on an extra swimsuit? When I sent Judy the sermon title on Wednesday, I had in mind what I might talk about. And I started doing some reading, some studying, and I thought, I don't think I can preach that. It's about the hardest message to put together that I've ever experienced. Um, it's going to be a little bit different message this morning. I always try to more teach, really, than preach. Uh, but this morning, we're really, I hope, by God's grace, going to do some studying. Do you have your Bible with you? Nothing's going to be on the screen this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, that you have promised that if we would read and study, Lord, that we might rightly divide your word. And Father, we know that it is your word that you use to wash us, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so I pray, Father, that you will teach us to study. Lord, that we might hear your voice. Father, that it might not be the voice of the person that wrote the book, the voice of the person that's preaching, Father, that each of us would learn to study your word so that we can hear your voice and what the Spirit says to the churches. I pray, Father, now that your Holy Spirit will come and enlighten our minds. I pray, Father, that you will put your words this morning in my mouth. Uh, Father, that you would direct my lips. And, Father, that we will hear your voice. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You've got a list of the citations. It's actually a pretty short list this morning. Jacqueline reminded me last night as I struggled that I didn't have to preach for an hour. Are you going to be able to do it? Preach for an hour? Oh, yeah. Turn with me to, Mark, uh, to Genesis chapter 8. Because this is the verse that I gave Judy, but it's going to be a little bit different than what I thought it was. Are you there? Say amen if you are. Amen. Genesis chapter 8, 21. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. Because the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, is it always going to remain? No. But while it remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. <coughs> So God said, look, I destroyed the earth. Noah's now come out of the ark. And God looked around and said, you know, I'm not going to do this again. Because frankly, if I sent a flood every time everyone was evil, I may have to start doing it probably every other month or so. So I'm not going to destroy the earth with a flood of waters again. And you put a rainbow in the cloud 
to promise us that. And when you look in the writings of the Spirit of Prophecy, there's very special meaning to that bow. Man has taken that rainbow and made it a symbol of something else because man always takes what God has done and twists it most horribly. But God said, as long as this earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will not cease. There will be some regularity. Has anyone noticed anything about the regularity of time and seasons these days? It's messed up. Right? I mean, what they used to call global warming, they had to change to climate change because they realized, well, it's really cold sometimes. Texas doesn't get to three degrees below zero. Right? So might this be a little bit of a warning? In fact, Jacqueline was noticing, what was uh, flowering the other day? The things are flowering at our house that are supposed to flower only in the spring. Right? The seasons themselves are messed up. I was teaching the youth class this morning, and I asked them, I said, you know, does anyone have any questions about what's going on in the world, the universe, America, Rust? No. Jed can tell you if I would mind he was there. They're kind of blithely going along with their lives. Are you? Is everything just going on? Just like it's always done for the last 50, 60, 70 years, however long you've been walking around? I asked them when Jesus was coming, by the way. It took about 25 minutes to turn this answer around. But the answer was basically when he gets around to it. Again, you can pop up and tell them if I'm lying. Turn with me to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. I've taken this to you, this, you to this verse probably many times over the last several years. Mark chapter 4, I'm starting with verse 26. Pastor talked about this in the sermonette earlier, right? There are wheat and tears in the church, and they will grow up together, right? And actually, if you're discerning and you're paying attention and according to the parable, one can actually discern between the wheat and the tears. But the primary reason that he said not to pull them up is that oftentimes the roots of the, of the good fruit are intertwined with the roots of the tears, the weeds. And if you try to pull them up, there are some who will get pulled up because they do not discern as well. Right? And so we're not to pull up the tears, we're to let them grow together, and at the end, the tears will be sh shaken out. So, Matthew, Mark chapter 4, verse 26, And he, Jesus, said, So is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground, and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up, he knows not how. For the earth brings forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full cord in the ear. Now, for most of mankind today, including for people out in the country in East Texas, as far as they know, the food just comes out of Walmart. I was shocked when I came out here. No one grows food anymore. A friend of mine had recently moved out into East Texas towards Lufkin. He went up in a plane a couple weekends ago. The guy was flying him around, and he was talking to me. He said, I was shocked. He said, I, I mean, I, he said, I knew it, but to see it, no one is growing food. Growing hay, and they're growing cattle. I guess that's food. But no one really grows food anymore. That's left to some big corporation farmers that, you know, can buy $500,000 combines, and no one grows food anymore. But the food doesn't just come out of Walmart, does it? In fact... First the earth brings forth of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full cord in the ear. And you really need to know about all these growth timings and processes, right? I'm about to start trying to do some of this and 
I'm ignorant, right? But hopefully I can learn something. Verse 29, but when the fruit is brought forth, there are wheat and there are tears, but when the fruit, when the good grain, when it is ripe, immediately God puts in the sickle because the harvest is coming. So I'm going to see if you can get this quicker than our kids. When is Jesus coming? When we're ready. When, we're ready. when the grain is ripe, immediately he puts in the sickle and the final harvest will take place. Okay? That's the sequence of events. And again, really, when I started thinking about this topic, I was looking at, the, I think it was this week, at the record, the Southwestern Conference record magazine at the... Adventist world that comes to my home, and I, you know, you, I browse through these articles, and you know, a lot of dog. Hughley's getting seventy-three million dollars in debt so that they can pass out more drugs and build more rooms. Um, you know, I mean, we're we're doing some nice things, and just the, the world is just kind of going along. And you would never know that winter's coming if you read those magazines. of God is a settling into the truth. Be careful what you're letting go into your mind because if it is unsettling the truth in your mind, you can never be sealed. Go to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. Daniel was a great prophet, was he not? God gave Daniel visions and dreams, did he not? Then God sent Gabriel, the angel that stands next to God, he sent him to talk to Daniel, did he not? In fact, Jesus Christ himself came and spoke to Daniel, did he not? Daniel chapter 9, verse 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, in the reign of Darius the Mede, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. In the first year of Darius, this is somewhere around 538, maybe, B.C., just prior to the end of the 70 years, Daniel figured out that it was just about to happen. He didn't know maybe exactly when. He didn't go to church and hear a great sermon. God didn't come and give him a vision or a dream. How did Daniel figure this out? By studying what? Books. He was reading Jeremiah, but I can't, I could not find it. I was reading, you know, Wednesday night we're going through the book of Jeremiah, and I was reading where Jeremiah found out stuff by studying books. And I thought, what books, we, what books was Jeremiah reading? Well, Jeremiah had been reading the writings of Moses and so forth. Well, these are great prophets of God, and God gave them visions and dreams and spoke directly to them. But how were they figuring out a lot of stuff? They were studying God's Word. Turn to Psalms chapter 90. Psalms chapter 90. 
I'm reading a chapter, folks, because it becomes more and more apparent to me that again, most of the most of the listening, whether the books or sermons that we do, is not listening to the thoughts of God. They're listening to the thoughts of a man who backs up what he wants to say by a verse or two. Some of those men are good and doing an honest job. Some are not. Okay, uh, and you know, I hope that I'm doing an honest job. I hope I'm doing a good job. But the truth is, if you want to know what God is saying, then you've got to read what God said. Not listen to a man tell you what he thinks and then can find a verse or two to maybe substantiate what he thinks. I really want to read Psalms 91 as well this morning, and I think we're going to come to why. But Psalms chapter 90. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Thou turnest man to destruction, and sayest, Return, you children of men. God chastises and says, Repent, return. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past and as a watch in the night. A thousand day years are as what? Yesterday. A thousand years is like a day to God. Thou carriest them away as with a flood. They are asleep in the morning. They are like grass which grows up. In the morning it flourishes and grows up. In the evening it's cut down and withers. For we are consumed by thine anger and by thy wrath are we troubled? In the end of time, are we going to be troubled by God's wrath? We call it the little time of trouble. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. Well, I thought God forgave and forgot all our sins. After judgment, he does. If you're following along in Jeremiah chapter 31, God makes that clear. Christians think, oh, well, you ask for forgiveness, it's gone. Not quite. That's not what the sanctuary system tells us. Verse 9, for all our days are passed away in, the, in thy wrath. We spend our years at the tale that is told. The days of our years are three score and ten. And if by reason of strength they be four score, eighty years... Yet is, their strength, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. A day is as to God a thousand, a thousand years is as a... Day. Teach us, God, to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? How long until you return? What did God just tell us? To count our days. Are they like a thousand years is like a day? Return, O Lord, how long, and let it repent thee concerning thy servants. O satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us, and the years wherein we have seen evil. Let thy work appear unto thy servants, and thy glory unto thy children. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yes, the work of our hands, establish thou it. Psalms chapter 91 opens, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Then you see the plagues coming, but they shall not come nigh thy dwelling. 
we need to read the Bible line upon line, line upon line. Because Psalm chapter 90 goes with Psalm chapter 91. You know how we know that? Because that's how God wrote it. Do you understand that? We love to, in studying to just skip around, and skipping around is okay because we are to read here a little and there a little, amen? But what's the primary way God teaches us according to Isaiah 28? Line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept. Is it possible chapter 90 spoke as we got into the little time of trouble in chapter 91 with the plagues falling got us into the great time of trouble? I think it's in the sermon this morning. You know, Ellen White said, we love to take things out of order. But do you think God is haphazard in what he does? Order is the first law of heaven. There's a reason why Psalms 90 is written, and then, right after it, Psalms 91. Okay? Someone might have assembled the Bible, and again, they've inserted chapters and so forth, but God is ultimately the author of all this. Amen? Go to first, uh, Second Peter chapter 3. Teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Second Peter. Chapter 3. Is it there? We're going to read the chapter. I want to read the verse, we're going to read the chapter. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in which, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Why is Peter writing? He wants to remind you of some things that were written long ago. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Who is saying this? Is this a bunch of atheists? Since the fathers fell asleep, this is the church saying this. This is people who purport to know God. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the water standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, don't be ignorant of this thing. That one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Teach us to number our days. Why? That we might apply our hearts to wisdom, that we might really start studying the Old Testament, because Peter is trying to stir you up, and he says, don't be ignorant, do not miss this point. One day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, verse 9, but he is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Because if Jesus Christ came tomorrow and his people haven't made a complete repentance, a turning from sin, we lose. And by the way, if we lose, Jeremiah says the world loses. Because he says, God, I know that we are in a sad shape, but Father, you've made a promise to us and you've given us the knowledge. And if you wipe us all out, then the whole world is lost. So God is delayed. God could have come a long time ago. We're told that expressly by the spirit of prophecy. By 1883, it's nearly 140 years ago, Jesus should have come. But why has he not come? 
Because the church is just merely going along doing things and yada da. Right? We're not repenting. Verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Do you get that? There is a limit. You can go yada da all you want, but there is a limit because God is a God of order. He does everything on time. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? This is going to happen. Everyone know how to play hide and seek? When you're done counting, what do you say? Ready or not, God says, here I come. Looking for and hasting, or King, the New King James will say hastening, because how you live, because he should have already come, but what's the only reason he hasn't come? How seventh day of Venice are living. Looking for and hastening unto the coming of, of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire will be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, we look for a new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwells righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, Seeing that you look for such things, are you looking for such things? One person is kind of maybe thinking about it. Heard one and a half yes. One strong yes, okay. Karen's going to heaven, praise God. Is it hot in here? And we 
must what? Number our days. But a day is as a... Does God keep time by days? You know, while seed time and harvest, while cold and winter seems to be off track, do the days keep coming up pretty regular night and day? God keeps track pretty well without deviation up to now with two small exceptions in the time of uh, Hezekiah and Joshua. God keeps pretty good track of the time by days. Is there any one special day Thank you, Tom. I was just about to finish. I'll be grateful to see. There's something called the Sabbath. You know that God is going to rest on the Sabbath in the 7,000th year, don't you? Are you numbering the days? You know the Spirit of Prophecy talks about it? Are you aware of this? Are you numbering your days? Are you applying your heart to wisdom? Conflict and Courage, page 53. The flames that consumed the cities of the plain shed their warning light down even to our time. We are taught the fearful and solemn lesson that while God's mercy bears along with the transgressor, there is a limit beyond which men may not go on in sin. When the limit is reached, then the offers of mercy are withdrawn and the ministration of judgment begins. The ministration of judgment begins. Where does judgment begin? At the house of the Lord. Right? So where will mercy first be withdrawn? So winter's coming, and where is it coming first? Are you counting on your pipes walking themselves into the house? The pipes wrapping themselves? Counsels and Courage, page 231. Behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. That's Isaiah chapter 26, verse 21. Our God is a God of mercy. With long sufferance and tender compassion, he deals with the transgressors of his law. But there is a point beyond which divine patience is exhausted. And if judgments of God are sure to follow, the Lord bears long with men and with cities mercifully giving warning to save them from divine wrath, but a time will come when pleadings for mercy will no longer be heard. The time is at hand when there will be sorrow in the world that no human balm can heal. And if you're in the church in Chile waiting for a jab, the time is coming when there will be no human balm who's going to help you. The Spirit of God is being withdrawn. Disasters by sea and by land follow one another in quick succession. How frequently we hear of earthquakes and tornadoes, of destruction by fire and flood with great loss of life and property. Apparently these calamities are capricious outbreaks of disorganized, unregulated forces of nature, wholly beyond the control of man, but in them all God's purpose may be read. Supposedly, this is all climate change, this is global warming, this is the scientists have this, you know, they don't have it figured out, but we know why. Do Seventh-day Adventists know why? Do those, the students of God's word know why? I hear the people say, but when I read some magazines, I don't hear it. La da da, going along. God's messengers in the great cities are not to become so discouraged over the wickedness, the injustice, the depravity which are called upon to face while endeavoring to proclaim the glad tidings of salvation. In every city, filled though it may be with violence and crime, there are many who with proper teaching may learn to become followers of Jesus. God's message for the inhabitants of earth's day is be ye also ready. For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh, Matthew 24, we are standing on the threshold of the crisis of the ages. Winter's coming. That he knows. The storm of God's wrath is gathering, and those only will stand who respond to the invitations of mercy, as did the inhabitants of Nineveh under the preaching of Jonah, and become sanctified through obedience to the laws of the divine ruler. That's a near quote of the Bible. We are sanctified by obeying the truth. 
The righteous alone shall be hid with Christ in God till the desolation be overpassed. That's Psalms 91. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 24. Susie, what's our time? Matthew chapter 24, because I'm way behind schedule. Sorry, Jack. Matthew chapter 24, verse 32. Now, learn a parable of the fig tree, Jesus said. And folks, God is a farmer, and we need to understand farming. If we're going to understand what God is going to do, again, I think it's Isaiah 60. God says, I'm going to bring forth righteousness just like I bring forth the blood of the tree, just like I bring forth the fruit. If you want to know how God is going to bring forth righteousness and you give, it's going to be done, you're going to have to understand how he brings forth the fruit on the tree. Do you know how, to, do you know how that's done? Or does that just go to Walmart and their apples are not as good as Kroger, but they'll do it. Learn a parable of the fig tree, when its branch is yet tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise you, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the door. And again, when someone is at the door, how far are they away from coming in? I hear that there was a thief in Rusk this week that broke, was breaking in the cars and breaking in the houses, whatever. When a thief comes and he's at the door, when does he come in? Whatever he can, you know, the door is unlocked or whatever. But if Jesus is at the door, when does he come in? When we open the door. But understand, ready or not, someone is going to open the door and let him in. Know that it is near, even at the door. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass until all these things are fulfilled. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and hour, knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the very day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Verse 36, But of that day and hour knows no man. So don't let anyone tell you the day or the hour. But don't let anyone give you verse 36 without giving you the rest of the passage. Because God commands you to know when it is near, even at the door, even at the time where all that is holding him back from stepping into this world is someone opening the door. Because someone is going to, and there is a limit. And when someone opens the door, Jesus will be coming ready or and judgment will begin at the house of the Lord. Now, go with me to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. Because again, Adventists love verse 36. And we've been burned. It wasn't even us that missed 1844. That was a bunch of Baptists and Methodists. But somehow we get the grief for it. We didn't set no time. We didn't exist. Nevertheless, We've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. Luke chapter 21, starting at verse 29. This should sound familiar to you. And he spake to them a parable, Behold the fig tree and all the trees. Now when they shoot forth, you see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. You know that. So likewise you, when you see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh, it is near at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass until all be fulfilled. But know when you are living in the last generation. We've talked about that. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. For as a sneer shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Did that passage sound familiar? What was it missing? It was 
missing the words that said, but of the day and hour knoweth no man. If that was the most important part of the passage, do you think that it would be repeated in all three Gospels? But it is not. Because it is not the most important thing in the passage, although we have elevated it and act as if it is. Does that make sense? Three times Jesus repeats this uh, passage, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Twice the verse is included, but no man knows the day or the hour in Matthew and Mark, but it is not included in the book of Luke. What to do because this just cannot become two parts for me. I'm reading to you from the Review and Herald, March 22nd, 1892. Okay? I'm going to preach an Ellen White sermon or a part of it in just a few moments. So turn your ears on to fast listening mode. God showed himself alive after his passion by many. This was a sermon preached in Lansing, Michigan, September 5th, 1891. The first part of it is recounted in this March 22nd, 1892 Review and Herald. It starts with a quote from the Bible. He showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore, when they therefore were come together, the disciples, they asked him, saying, Lord, Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? This is after the resurrection, but the disciples are still as clueless as they can be. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. The disciples were anxious to know the exact time for the revelation of the kingdom of God, but Jesus tells them that they may not know the times and the seasons, for the Father has not revealed them. To understand when the kingdom of God should be restored was not the thing of most importance for them to know. It was not what? It was not the most important thing for them to know. Was it important? It wasn't the most important. <clears throat> now let me ask you something. If Jesus Christ in AD 31 had said to the disciples, the people of God are going to screw around and not allow me to come until 2000 and something, What do you think would have run through Peter and John's mind? They would have just fallen out of their chair and given up hope, wouldn't they? Jesus always wants us to live with his returning view, right? This is why Jesus was going to go on and say, Peter, you're going to die. And, and Peter would turn and say, hey, but Jesus, what's going to happen to John? What about this disciple? And Jesus is going to intentionally say, and the Bible says he did not say that he would live, but Jesus knew, and that's why he said he didn't say it. He said something, and they misunderstood it to say that John would live until Jesus returned. Because we all have always needed to live with the hope of Jesus coming. Because a sinful human heart loves foolishness, and if we're not looking at Jesus and thinking... What does your house look like when no one's come over for a month? Josh knows what mine looks like when no one's come over for a month because he often comes over then and he sees it. But normally when you know someone is coming over, what do you do? You clean up. And Jesus said, be diligent because I'm going to be at the door and I'm knocking and I'd like to come in. So be diligent all the time because you need to live with the expectation of my coming. Does this make sense? But Ellen White makes clear and says this was not the most important thing. Now then, late in her life, Ellen White came to say, I've come to understand that we're going to be in this world many more years. And what a sad revelation it was. But at the beginning of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, at the, the beginning of this the ministry of Ellen White, God has said, it's going to be another 180 years until I come. 
you think J. Andrews would have sacrificed his life and jumped on a boat to go over to Europe? That these guys would have gone to the islands of the South Pacific? If Jesus is not coming until who knows when? Do you get the point? Daniel figured out by reading books just before it happened when the 70 years were about to expire. God didn't give him revelation. He was studying. And when did God allow him to find out? Just before it took place. God told Noah that it's going to be 120 years and I'm going to destroy this earth. Noah's grandfather was named Methuselah, and that name means when he dies, it will come. And if you look at the biblical record, you, uh, you can read and, and, sh and just show, look at the years, you can figure out that in the very year that Methuselah died, the flood came. And Noah, having known 120 years ago, God told me this, and then he sees Methuselah die in that 120th year, he says, man, let's get the last nail in that big board and get the animals in this boat. Do you understand that? God said, I'm never going to destroy the world by a flood again, but is he going to destroy this world? Yes. Do you think God is going to let it happen and have, we have no clue when? Does God do anything without disclosing it to his servants and prophets? The coming of Jesus Christ is the biggest event in the history of the universe, the second coming. You think it's going to come by and we have no clue what's about to happen? Folks, there are good messages out there about the 6,000 years. And I believe that we can know it relatively precisely. Now, we, we do not know the day or year is coming. But there's a lot we can figure out from that. And there is some good messages out there that suggest that that is very precise. The 70-year captivity, if you've been listening on the Wednesday night on Jeremiah, I believe Jeremiah is very clearly telling us that the end of the 70 years will coincide with the beginning of the little time of trouble. Can we know when the end of the 70 years will happen? Well, by the reading of books, maybe a book called Questions on Doctrine, if you just look in the inside cover, you can understand and know when the 70 years are coming to an end, which if that coincided with the 6,000th year, coincidence? <coughs> are we studying? Or do we just think Jesus is going to show up, I don't know, when he gets back from vacation, when he help, finishes helping those other people over in the other part of the universe, maybe, you know, when he gets around to it. Are we studying? Have you noticed that winter's coming? Have you gotten your boots? Do you want to be wearing flip-flops all winter? Because a lot of us folks, we're getting ready for a winter. And the worst winter in the universe is about to happen on this earth. And most of us Preparation, huh? What? Are we getting ready? I really want to preach about that 6,000 years. I really want to preach about the 70 years, but I, I don't know if I ever will, because I'm going to read some things to you, because we're not to hang our religion on time. We're not to hang our religion on trying to figure something out precisely. But if you don't think that God has revealed it, then you haven't read the Bible, and you haven't read the Spirit of Prophecy. You've heard someone read a sentence out of the Spirit of Prophecy, and men that I greatly respect have said some things that I'm like, but with all due respect, brother, you may well be right, and I may be wrong, but have you considered the rest of that article? Because some of your words are in direct contravention of what the rest of the article says. One of my favorite things always to do with the judge when the other side would cite some cases, judge, don't believe me, don't believe my cases, just keep reading the case that they cited. Because if you like their case, they lose. 
And so just read, but you must read the article for yourself. Because if you're listening to the words of men, I read these three Ellen White articles. I knew the language that I was looking for. We're not to say it's one year or two years or five years. We're not to say it's going to be as many as 20 years. I looked for that language and I found three articles. And I read these articles and I said, well, I can't preach what I want to preach. I don't think it would be honest. And by the time I read them for the third time, I said, well, okay, I'm not, that's not, I'm not preaching the sermon that I thought I was going to preach. But I've heard these things quoted, and some of the language that's quoted in the first article gets quoted in the book of Evangelism, gets quoted in last day events, gets quoted all this selected message, gets quoted all over the place. Have you ever read the actual article? Because back in 1970, they didn't have it available to them, but you do. You have the entire article available to you on your phone. Are you listening to the thoughts of man, or are you studying to show yourself approved? Are you reading God's word to say, I'm listening not to the thoughts of man, I'm reading God's word. I know what God thinks, not what a man thinks. Does that make sense? Will someone nod their heads at me? Folks, this is life and death. Jeremiah says things, and he says, look, God is sending before you life and death, and some of the things Jeremiah says are counterintuitive. So you, if you don't understand that God said it, you're just going to go, oh, I, I need to fight that, I need to fight Nebuchadnezzar, I need to fight the Pope, I need to fight everything that he says. No. God says, no. It's counterintuitive. God says, I'm sending before you life and death, and we've got to read God's word for ourselves. And I don't care if you don't like me. I don't care if it's my life sermon. If you don't read God's word, you will die. It's in here later, Great Controversy, page 593 to 594. Only those whose minds are fortified with the word of God are going to stand the last test. If you have memorized every Doug Bassett sermon, if you have read every article Mark Finley ever read, it cannot save you. Good men, God's men, it will not save you. But the word of God is able to save your souls, James 1.21, if it is meekly received, if it is chewed, if it becomes a part of you. God's word, not man's word, God's word, it's able to save your soul. And I know you guys like to eat because it's 12.35 and you're probably thinking, shut up so we can go eat. But man shall not live by the Bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And I'm just going to. You read the Sabbath, you study the Sabbath school lesson, and you consider yourself a good Seventh day Adventist? No. The book of Deuteronomy, they're going to show you maybe one, not even one twentieth of what's in Deuteronomy, or in Jeremiah, or whatever. If you are not reading the word of God for yourself, you will die. Period. You've got to make God the man of your counsel. Not a man, the man of your counsel. Whether he be good or bad, that's not the point. You've got to make God the man of your counsel. Susie, where are we? 53. 53. Where are we on our list? Let me keep reading you this sermon because, folks, again, things are quoted out of this message and they are repeatedly quoted out of compilation books. But you don't have to read just the compilation books. You, at the end of every compilation book, at the end of the paragraph, it tells you where this came from and you now have access to it. To understand when the kingdom of God should be restored was not the thing of most importance for them to know. They were to be found following the master, praying, waiting, watching, and working. They were to be representatives to the world of the character of Christ. That which was essential for a Christian character experienced in the days of the disciples is essential in our day. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And after the Holy Ghost has come upon them, what were they to do? And you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. This is the work which we are to be engaged. Instead of living in expectation of some special season of excitement, 
We are wisely to improve present opportunities, doing that which must be done in order that souls may be saved. Instead of exhausting the powers of our mind in speculation in regarding to the times and seasons which the Lord has placed in his own power. No speculations. And sometimes men that I like, probably including myself, right, like to speculate. It's fun. And when I do it, someone, someone should just stand up and say, shut up. Right? Judy, I'll count on you to do it. I believe you will, right? Praise God. Right? No, if it's not out of God's word, folks, who cares what some man thinks? Speculation is no good. Studying God's word by study of books. Jeremiah understood when this event was about to happen just before it happened. That's not speculation. Okay? Get the difference? But there's people that run around, again, people that I like, I've probably done it myself, I'm sure I have, who start speculating on what it could be. Okay, it's fun to do, but... Instead of exhausting the powers of mind in speculation in regard to times and seasons which the Lord has placed in his own power and withheld from men, we are to yield ourselves to the control of the Holy Spirit and to do present duties to give the bread of life unadulterated with human opinions to souls who are perishing with the truth. Uh, perishing for the truth, sorry. All right. Satan is ever ready to fill the mind with theories and calculations that will divert men from the present truth. What is present truth, by the way? That if you do all these things diligently, Peter says, second, first Peter chapter, second Peter chapter one, you will never fall. And he reminds you of this present truth, right? Because the most important thing is not when he comes. The most important thing is that when he comes, and he will, because there's a limit, that when he comes, you will be found of him in peace, without spot and blame. For our Savior often had to speak reprovingly to those who indulge in speculations were ever inquiring into those things which the Lord has not revealed. Jesus had come to earth to impart important truths to men, and he wished to impress their minds with the necessity of receiving and obeying his precepts and instructions of doing their present duty, and his communications were of an order that imparted knowledge of their immediate and daily use. Do you understand why Jesus... Why didn't Jesus tell him that he was going to come around... 20, 30, give or take. Would that have helped Paul and Peter in their daily use? It would have crushed them. Of course he didn't tell them. Did he tell Ellen White? No. Close to the end of her life, he finally let her know, y'all are going to be here a lot longer. Okay? But God doesn't... God tells us what we need to know. You have a kid... And they keep asking you, bugging you with questions, and what do you sometimes tell them? I'll tell you when you need to know. Right? Because they would make a wrong use of the knowledge. I tell my kids I'm going somewhere in two weeks, they start packing the next day. They would make a wrong use of the knowledge. Now, do I need to tell them the day before we're going, that we're going? Yeah. Because now they need to be prepared for tomorrow. Do you think God is an unwise parent and is not going to tell his people and reveal it to them just before they need to know? Then you need to be studying like that. Okay, let me try to shorten this up. Christ gave to his disciples truths whose breadth and depth and value they little appreciated or even comprehended. And the same condition exists among the people of God today. We don't understand the value of what God is trying to teach us. Okay? That's what you just said. Listen to this. We too have failed to take in the greatness to perceive the beauty of the truth which God has entrusted to us today. Should we advance in spiritual knowledge, we would see the truth developing and expanding in lines of which we have little dreamed. But... And you guys can hold this, hold me to it, because I'm going to need you to hold me to it. But it will never develop in any line that will lead us to imagine that we may know the times and the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. Again and again, I have been warned in regard to time setting. 
there will never again be a message for the people of God that will be based on time. We are not to know the definite time, either for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit or for the coming of Christ. Okay. There will never be a message for the people of God that will be based on time. I've heard that and I've seen good men quote that over and over again. Let me keep reading for you. I'm skipping some stuff in the next paragraph. She again says, The Lord showed me that the message must go and that it must not be hung on time, for time will never be a test again. Because when is Jesus coming? When someone opens the door. But don't be ignorant, friends. There's a limit. And someone's going to open the door. And if you don't, ready or not, the time, I'm, I'm skipping, okay. Then she goes and she says, look, when I was thinking about this, she's about to head to Australia, she said, I'm thinking about this subject, and I found a copy of, she says, she found an envelope on which was written testimony given in regard to time setting, June 21, 1851, right? The people of God in 1851 are very much, they keep trying to set times, right? Some of the Adventist churches in form yet, so I'm not going to take credit for that. It's not God's church, I'm supposed to say. But his people keep trying to set times, and so she talk, wrote a lot about it. So she finds this, she finds this envelope. Uh, she says, it says, Testimony of Gibbon in regard to time setting, June 21, 1851, preserved carefully. I opened it and this is what I found. It reads, a copy of the vision the Lord gave Sister White, June 21, 1851, in Camden, New York. The Lord showed me that the message must go and that it must not be hung on time, for time will never again be a test. Okay? Then she's going down and reading from this letter. Uh, okay, so it's a short letter, and then she says, uh, this was the document I came upon last Monday and searched over my writings, and here is another which was written in regard to the man who was setting time in 1884. This is 1892, she's writing this. He was setting time in 1884 and setting broadcast his arguments to prove his theories. The report of what he was doing was brought to me at the Jackson, Michigan camp meeting, and I told the people they need to not take heed to this man's theory, for the event he predicted would not take place. The times and the seasons God has put in his own power, and why has not God given us this knowledge? Because we would now make a right use of it, as this man did. A condition of things would result from this knowledge among our people that would greatly retard the work of God in preparing a people to stand in the great day that is to come. If I told my people when I was coming, the work of getting them ready would be retarded. But I thought that if you know that someone is coming, you get ready. I mean, isn't that how it works? If you know that someone is coming over the house, you, you tidy and you put away the shoes and where they're supposed to go and you... You dust off all the, you know, the two inches on slang on a piano or whatever, don't you? Not to procrastinate. God is not telling us the time because if He did, the work of getting ready would be retarded. What does she mean, folks? Think about this. You would think you still have time. It's the 1890s. God is not coming for 130 or 40 years. If He told them to then in 1890. Let's go on vacation, and when we get back, we can get ready. <laughs> Is that the sinful human heart? Yeah. Yes, and if we knew, that's right. But if we knew that he wasn't coming, we would forget that he's always knocking on the door because I, my next breath might be my last. Because you've got to understand that test is not the time. When we're ready is the time, but a lot of what Ellen White is writing She's writing for the last days, folks. But she's also not telling them in the 1890s when he's coming. And God didn't show her because if he did, it wasn't going to be for a long time. And they would have made a terrible use of it. But just before he's coming, might he tell us? Might it be revealed in his word that if we study by books, like Daniel, we might understand. Because again, she said that. 
A condition of things which would result, which would delay, retard the work of God in preparing people to stand on the day that is come. We are not to live upon time and excitement. Amen. We are not to be engrossed with speculations in regard to the times and seasons which God has not revealed. Jesus has told his disciples to watch, but not for definite time. Why not definite time? Because it's based on when someone will open the door. Because Jesus is not a thief. He's not breaking down the door. He's coming when someone says, come in. Amen? They are to watch the work to wait to pray as they approach the time for the coming of the Lord, but no one will be able to predict just when that time will come. For of that day and hour knoweth no man. You will not be able to say that he will come in one, two, or five years. Neither are you to put off his coming by stating that it will not be for ten or twenty years. It is the duty of God, people of God to have their lamps trimmed and burned. You have not a moment to lose in neglect of the great salvation that has been provided to you. To the, the time of the probation of souls is coming to an end. And as Judy wisely reminds us, and we should always be careful to remember, that could be your next breath. That could be closing your eyes tonight to go to sleep. Right? Our duty is not to be looking forward to some special time for some special work to be done for us, but to go forward in our work of warning the world, for we are to be witnesses of Christ in the uttermost parts of the world. All around us are the young, the impenitent, the unconverted, and what are we doing for them? Parents, in the ardor of your first love, are you seeking for the conversion of your children? Or are you engrossed with the things of this life to such an extent that you are not making earnest efforts to be laborers together with God? Skipping again. Today you are to give yourself to God that you may be emptied of self, emptied of envy, jealousy, evil surmising, strife, everything that shall be dishonoring to God. Today you are to have your vessel purified that it may be ready for the heavenly dew, ready for the showers of the latter rain, for the latter rain will come, and the blessing of God will fill every soul that is purified from every defilement. It is our work today to yield our souls to Christ that we may be fitted for the time of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. The latter rain is not going to make you ready. Is, is that what I just read? If you are not ready when the latter rain falls in sealing power, you lose. You missed out. And winter is coming. Have you noticed? The young, the young adults haven't noticed. How is it that Seventh-day Adventist young adults haven't noticed? Is that their fault or our fault? How is it possible that they come to church every Sabbath and go through their Sabbath school lesson and have no clue? finishing it. So, folks, go home and read these articles. Y'all can decide whether you want to hear the rest of this or not. Go home and read the entire articles and see what God says. Because men quote lines or sentences. And again, you know, I'm not faulting anyone for quoting a line or a sentence, right? If I read every, I mean, you know, that's why my sermons go painfully long, right? Very much, but make sure that you are going back and studying to show yourselves approved, and that you are actually hearing God's voice and not just a man's voice. Because men are fallible. I'm fallible. Everyone's fallible, right? Make sure that you're studying and hearing God's voice, because God is speaking to His people, and God is not going to leave us in the dark. But again, when I look at certain magazines that come to the house, I don't read them from, I mean, I don't read them from cover to cover, but when I flip through them, it's just like, business as usual. And it's not business as usual. So, Heavenly Father,